started. So, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Brain Space Initiative. Um, uh, and uh, it's my pleasure uh, this week to introduce Gustavo Deco. Um, he is currently uh, a research professor at the Institutio Catalana. Uh, I'm going to get all of this wrong, but <laughs> um, okay. at uh, Pompeu Fabra University. Um, and he leads a computational neuroscience group. Uh, and he also directs the Center uh, of Brain and Cognition. Uh, he has been doing a lot of work in uh, the area of uh, brain imaging and dynamics and dynamical systems. Uh, and uh, I think uh, you'll really enjoy his talk today. Um, he's going to talk to us about the turbulence of life. No, actually the turbulence of brain, um, perhaps introduced by the turbulence of life. Uh, and, um, uh, and and share with us today uh, some of the innovative approaches that he has been uh, developing and applying uh, to uh, various types of uh, structural and functional brain imaging data. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, to uh, pass uh, pass it on to you, Gustavo, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Vince, for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, also, all the organizers. I mean, it's really a pleasure to be here and to have the possibility to present uh, part of my research. I decided to go for a relatively a new subject, which is uh, the use of turbulence in the context of, uh, of, uh, of neuroscience. Uh, as you know, turbulence uh, in principle has to do with uh, dynamics, but a, a totally different type of dynamics, namely fluid dynamics, and in principle has nothing to do with, uh, with the human brain. I will try to, to show and first to motivate that it makes sense really to look at the signature of turbulence in the context of uh, brain dynamics in general. Uh, I will focus today on human brain dynamics, but uh, it's in general. And, uh, and also to use the tools that the, the theory of turbulence offers to us to try to deepen our understanding of the, of the brain. Um, I will I will start with a relatively long motivation because it's an unusual subject and I will try first to give you a flavor or an intuition of why turbulence and, and, and why I decided to look at turbulence in the context of neuroscience. Let me start historically with the, with the origin of the word turbulence. Actually, uh, turbulence was for the first time a, a expressed it in Italian, uh, turbulenza. Uh, came, uh, of course, from Latin, uh, turba, which means uh, crowd, and was introduced by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, and, and Leonardo da Vinci was really captured and, uh, and attracted by, uh, by the phenomenon of, uh, of, of, of what he called uh, turbulence, of turbulence. Uh, and he, he, he was so much captured by that and uh, was trying to express that in his in many of his drawings uh, of turbulence because of this mixture between order and disorder that you see here for example when you have this falling of water in a, on a pond of breaking the flow of water by by some object and you start to develop those uh, turbulence wheels uh, those vortices then on one hand, you have really a thing that looks really crowded, therefore he uses the word uh, turba, turbulence. Uh, so non-order, random, uh, chaotic, if you want. But on the other hand, uh, you have a lot of uh, order uh, on top of this uh, underlying disorder. And that was uh, extremely interesting for Leonardo. Of course, he was only able to capture that uh, with his drawing, but not uh, scientifically. After that, I mean, uh, after Leonardo uh, really uh, asked that, I mean, that's uh, or, or, or realized it, how how important is this mixture between order and disorder? Of course, people in physics uh, started to try to to make sense of that and to offer some mechanistic explanation of why turbulence. And in fact, uh, the whole thing started with the uh, oil uh, who managed to express the first equation for fluid dynamics, but he didn't manage to express turbulence because he didn't include a, a feature which is extremely important, namely the viscosity uh, and its origin of the turbulence. And therefore, uh, years after that, uh, 
Claude Navia eh, um, um, actually George eh, eh, Stokes created the Navier Stokes equation, which basically complemented the Euler equation by adding viscosity, and they were able to eh, express eh, turbulence from a mechanistic point of view. Nevertheless, eh, um, there was at some point, eh, eh, well, it's also eh, before I mentioned that. Eh, uh, very important to to mention that uh, Hoff Ludwig Hoff uh, was also very much interested in turbulence, and I say that because you will see that in my talk I will use a model which is based on the Hoff model, and for me it was a surprise and a discovery that uh, he formulated uh, his uh, original theory, the Hoff theory of bifurcation, uh, and the Hoff oscillators um, uh, in the context of turbulence during his PhD thesis, uh, and it's, uh, it's an extra connection that I realized it a posteriori, because we were using Hoff uh, models uh, since many years uh, for uh, describing uh, brain dynamics, and therefore now it's natural to combine uh, all three elements, uh, turbulence, Hoff, and, and brain dynamics. A revolution that was actually my main motivation, I have to confess, uh, in the context of fluid dynamics was uh, caused by Andrei Kolmogorov. And Andrei Kolmogorov uh, was the first one that say, well, look, I mean, we have an, a mechanistic explanation by the equation of Navier Stokes, as I said, of the emergence of turbulence, but still we don't understand at all uh, turbulence. And he was very skeptical that uh, such an a priori approach, a bottom-up approach, a mechanistic approach, would really be useful for the understanding of why turbulence. And therefore, he proposed the theory that he called a phenomenological theory of turbulence. I think phenomenological is a bad name in his context. I would have called that a statistical theory of turbulence. But the key idea is that instead of trying to explain everything uh, microscopically, uh, ab initio, uh, he tried to offer a mesoscopic, macroscopic, a statistical explanation. And that is the second commonality with neuroscience. As, as I said, the first one was this mixture of order and disorder that we see in the context of turbulence. When we see brain signals, we also see a mixture between order and disorder. So first motivation. Second motivation, the Kolmogorov approach. Uh, we have in neuroscience nowadays, in, especially in theoretical neuroscience, my field, uh, exactly the same dilemma in the sense that, well, we we know the equation of neurons, of synapses, perhaps we can put uh, all together and perhaps cognition emerge from that. And as you know, there were many, many discussion about this uh, epistemological approach and, and many of the theoreticians, we are pretty much convinced or against that that cannot work. That's uh, that uh, could be a complementary approach, but uh, an up initio, bottom up, approach where we uh, we start uh, microscopically and try to as uh, to explain the macroscopic uh, world how in our case how cognition emerged uh, we are very skeptical about that and that happened exactly the same in the context of uh, of uh, turbulence and therefore it was wiser really to see how Kolmogorov managed to solve the problem and perhaps uh, his tools would be useful for us and as we will see that is uh, the case. The last thing is just anecdotic. I mean, uh, I am coming originally from quantum electrodynamics, so I was always a fan of Schrodinger, uh, Heisenberg, and all those guys. And for me, also was a discovery that Heisenberg uh, invested many years of his life uh, in the research of uh, turbulence. And there is an anecdotic issue. I don't know if it is true, but in any case, it's nice. Uh, when he was about to die as he, uh, at uh, his deathbed, I mean, he was asked, well, you will meet God now uh, pretty soon. So what are your questions? What are you going to ask him? And uh, he said, well, I would ask uh, about relativity. Why relativity and why turbulence? And I am pretty sure that he would have a good answer for the first one. So meaning that he he died uh, absolutely convinced and frustrated about not understanding uh, the complexity of turbulence. So uh, before we go and we focus to the 
to the real content of the talks. I mean, let me say two words more about turbulence uh, in the context of this movie, uh, this animation. This is uh, um, a, a fluid uh, uh, evolving in a, in a turbulent regime. And there was uh, an observation done by Louis Richardson about uh, the structure of the order that was also captured by Leonardo da Vinci, as I said at the beginning. He observed it as there were uh, wheels, or vortices of different size, and those vortices of different size, they are, uh, they are uh, forming uh, uh, a spatial hierarchical structure that could be very useful for uh, the transmission of energy and information. And that was uh, the key idea, well, he expressed that in this poetic way by paraphrasing the Jonathan Swift, uh, Siphonaptera, and trying to express in this funny way, I mean, that the wheels, the vortices that we observe in fluid dynamics, they are uh, forming a cascade uh, or have a hierarchical organization according their size across the, the spatial scale. And that was basically uh, interpreted by Kolmogorov and is the key of his uh, phenomenological theory uh, in the sense that uh, perhaps that is the most important issue that we need to concentrate on. Namely, that uh, if we have this cascade of, uh, of uh, sizes of different wheels, that is extremely efficient for transmitting energy across space. Why? Because in the context of fluid dynamics, the energy is just kinetic energy, so it's velocity, it's movement. And if you transmit uh, this kinetic energy uh, in the big, uh, the large uh, uh, wheel to the next uh, medium wheel, then it's very efficient if you do this in this uh, cascaded form. And in fact, uh, that was the first motivation of Kolmogorov. He introduced a concept which is it's also another casualty, it's called structure functions. Of course, it has nothing to do with what call structure or function in the context of neuroscience. Uh, but uh, as we will see, it has a similarity. Uh, the structure function is basically just the, the quadratic difference of the displacement in a, in a distance r of uh, your main variable. In the case of Kolmogorov was the velocity, in our case will be uh, our neural activity signals, in particular in our case will be the ball signals. Uh, okay, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, it's even more interesting that you can uh, separate this in two terms and basically the main term, so the, the core of this uh, structure function definition is this bear and this bear is nothing else as the correlation between these two signals, which are in two locations separated by an Euclidean distance r. So this is the functional connectivity. This is what we call the functional connectivity. The only difference or the only nuance is that uh, we will look at the functional connectivity as a function of the distance r between the pairs that we are observing. And this is the key idea that we will see. Why? Because Kolmogorov, thanks to these structural functions, or thanks to the functional connectivity, of course, he was not aware that we will be using this terminology in the context of neuroimaging uh, many years after uh, after him, but uh, he was able to show experimentally and theoretically that uh, in fact, if you look at the structure function or the functional connectivity as a function of the of the space, you see a power law, and this power law is basically uh, quantifying this intuition of Richardson and Kolmogorov. That's the hierarchical structure of the different sizes of wheels of vortices across the space, in fact, is extremely useful for transmitting energy, as it's shown here, or transmitting information in form of correlations, uh, as is shown by the structure functions, uh, in a very efficient way across the space. And, and that was the main motivation. So therefore, I will use those tools and, and some others that I will define soon uh, in the context of uh, brain dynamics. I will concentrate uh, on uh, neuroimaging uh, and first, in the first step, just empirically, so without any, any modeling, I will just analyze the data 
And I will ask the question if the signature of turbulence, if there are uh, something that we could call turbulence. I, I, I try to com, uh, will try to convince you that uh, indeed that is the case uh, by analyzing uh, human brain uh, data, in particular resting state uh, ball data. Uh, of course, uh, after that, I mean, it's, uh, it's very nice to know that brain dynamics perhaps is turbulent, but we don't know why and we don't know if it is an epiphenomenon, if it is useful or it's not. Of course, the motivation is uh, following Kolmogorov that perhaps turbulence is there as the, as the more uh, core uh, of the dynamics, uh, just as a question of efficiency for, the, for, for offering the background to, uh, to transmit information and energy in a very efficient way across space and time. And therefore, in the second part of the talk, I will really try to explain the emergence of turbulence in the context of brain dynamics by using uh, whole brain models. And I will use, in fact, a, a Hoff model that, as I mentioned before, he already used it uh, in the context of uh, fluid dynamics and we use it in the context of neuroscience, of uh, human brain dynamics. Then I will very briefly refer back to the original motivation that, in fact, we also will find power flow in the functional connectivity or in the structure functions in the context of, uh, uh, of brain dynamics. And that will close the circle, saying that turbulence is there, not uh, as an epiphenomenon, but really uh, as a way of implementing an efficient transmission of information across space time. And if I have time, I will just uh, finish with a couple of uh, words about the, the future, because one of the key features of uh, turbulence is uh, namely non-equilibrium, which is something that we always uh, are ignoring in the context of brain dynamics, and that would be extremely promising and useful. So let's concentrate first on brain dynamics. I take the human connectome project data. So we analyze uh, around more than 1,000 people, 1,003 subjects, and the, the two resting state conditions that the human connectome project uh, offers are, as you know, 22 minutes resting state, uh, two sessions uh, with an excellent TR of 0 0.72. So, uh, fantastic conditions for a statistical analysis. Uh, given that we are from the very beginning uh, interested in, in measures which are taking into account the, the distance, uh, because it was one of the core ideas of the, of the Komogorov theory, then we decided to go for a relatively fine parcellation. So uh, we are working and all the results uh, emerging from the Schaeffer parcellation with thousand uh, different nodes. So this is my only technical uh, slide and I think it's very important. So um, don't be afraid, of it. I, will, I will take you through the slide. Um, this is very important because it's a very simple concept uh, that was defined in the in the context of turbulence. That was defined in the context of turbulence in order to apply turbulence to uh, contexts which are non-fluid. Uh, was initiated by Kuramoto, and the concept is so simple that, of course, we can apply uh, that uh, in the context of uh, bolt uh, dynamics. Uh, and a posteriori, you will see that we. We will ask ourselves why we didn't come to this idea, come to this idea before, uh, uh, because it's absolutely independent of, of, of the turbulence theory. Well, the idea that is shown here is that uh, Kuromoto was, as you know, very much interested in system of oscillators. So he wanted to study just for fun. I mean, uh, you have uh, many oscillators at different uh, position x uh, evolving in time. And you can describe this by a close equation. In fact, he was using the Hopf oscillator, the so-called Stuart Landau oscillator. Of course, uh, they are independent, but you can couple them. Uh, and the usual way of coupling is this through a summation, in this case, because the, they, are, they are in a continuous position, then it's the integral, and you have some extra nodes. The particularity here is actually the weighting of this coupling. He uses the weighting factor 
and this is what he called non-local coupling, which was an exponential factor. This is important to mention why, because it's not a random, it's not a full connection, it's not nearest neighbor. These were the three typical type of coupling that people were studying all the time. And he decided to go a, a little bit in the direction of an extension of nearest neighbor. Of course, an exponential coupling is a kind of nearest neighbor, but uh, uh, you are not only taking your next neighbor, but you are taking all the neighbors in, with an exponential lambda. Good. That's the system that you want to study. The way how he decided to study that is by looking at the level of synchronization. As, as you know, there is a concept which is called the global Kuramoto order parameter, which is basically just the summation, the integral, if, uh, or, the, or in this case, of the exponents of the imaginary part of the phases. This is a horrible number, but we know that uh, if this number, if you take the module of this number, which is R, so uh, this is an, a beautiful number between zero and one and has a very nice interpretation, namely that zero is instant, there is no synchronization at all, and one that there is a lot of synchronization or full synchronization. Good, that's the global version of the uh, Kuramoto order parameter. But here what we have is the local Kuramoto parameter. So inside of the summation of this exponent, we introduce exactly this coupling, this exponential coupling. That means that now the, the, the synchronization value that you capture in the module of this uh, summation is dependent not only on time, but it's also dependent on the position and therefore it's local. And the interpretation is exactly the same. At that position, at that uh, uh, particular time point, R, is a measure of the local level of synchronization. So from that point of view, it's an extension of the general uh, global Kuramoto order parameter. In fact, I mean, for this system of oscillator, he was plotting for all the oscillators, which are at different uh, spatial uh, points in the space, for all times, this, uh, the value of this module of the local Kuramoto order parameter, which was between zero and one, and as you see, that's when it's yellow, uh, means that the level of local synchronization is extremely high. And when it's uh, deep blue uh, or violet, uh, the level of local synchronization is practically absolutely destroyed. So, so what you see here is a very rich change in the dynamics uh, from the point of view of the local level of synchronization, spatial and temporally. And, uh, and that's, remember us, the, the wheels that we have seen in the context of uh, fluid dynamics, because those vortices are basically reflecting local spatial temporal synchronization. And this is exactly what we are seeing here, uh, local level of uh, spatial temporal synchronization, and it's uh, changing, like in the case of uh, turbulent dynamics in, in fluids, in a very rich way. In a very rich way means that the variance of this across space and the variance of this across time, so the general variance across space-time, is large. And this is a, a way of uh, using now a very concrete measure that the only uh, needs uh, is, uh, or the only thing that we need is just the phases of our signals, and that is what we have in the context of, uh, of uh, for example, ball brain dynamics, and offers a number, a quantification that if this number is different from zero, so if this is rich, means that we have really a, a turbulent dynamic. And this uh, turbulence means that we have a rich dynamical repertoire and uh, rich in the, in the sense that it's changing a lot the level of synchronization across space and time as we were characterized uh, as we are characterizing by this particular measure. In fact, that's concentrate now only here. There are, there are just double checks that we can ignore for the moment. These are the results on the thousands HCP subjects uh, across the resting state uh, sessions uh, across space and time, and basically it's the variance of this local Kuramoto order parameter. And what we see here uh, for all the the subject is that uh, um, the mean value is around 0 0.2, 0 0.19, in fact. 
Uh, of course, I mean, in order to claim that this is significantly different from zero, you have to run different type of surrogates. This is one of the standard surrogates, just shuffling the time, and then you destroy the turbulence. So they, this is turbulence, meaning that we have a, a, a very um, significant variance of the local query motor or the parameter across the space and time, and then we can uh, associate or we can call this uh, very particular type of dynamic uh, a turbulent dynamic. In fact, just to give you a more concrete flavor, uh, these are snapshots of the phases of the ball signals. Uh, this is a particular subject in the HCP. These are the thousand nodes, the thousand regions of the Schaeffer parcellation, the phases of each of these regions for different time points. Uh, and what you see here is here the this clustering, uh, which is reflecting those wheels which are captured by the local Kuramoto order parameter, and that those clusters are changing a lot, of course, across the space and across time. If you see that in the surrogate, of course, you destroy all the structure and you don't see any kind of signature of uh, turbulence. Perhaps the, the Hollywood version of that is uh, by rendering the local Gura motor the parameter for a particular subject. Uh, again, I mean, this is uh, experimental data um, in the 3D or in the flat uh, version. And what you see here is uh, really this uh, turbulent behavior. So in other words, that's the local uh, local in, in a spatial temporal sense, a uh, level of synchronization is changing a lot. Uh, and that's what I meant before by saying, well, actually, uh, it's a very good idea to measure the local level of synchronization. We always, uh, in particular in neuroimaging, we were obsessed with the, what we call metastability, which is the variance of the global Kuramoto parameter. We know that that is a really very interesting and informative quantification. And that is nothing else. So forget uh, all what I said about turbulence. But uh, from that point of view, it's nothing else as a generalization of this concept of metastability in the sense that instead of taking just the global level of synchronization, we take the local level of synchronization. We see the variability across time and space. And that is uh, what we are reflecting here. So for the moment, we know that this is, uh, uh, that the brain is, the human brain at least, is turbulent in, in, in Kolmogorov and Kuramoto sense, but we don't know if that is good, if it is, if it is a casualty, is it anecdotic or is useful. And for that, we will try to go into a, a mechanistic explanation. So as you know, the whole brain models has two ingredients. One ingredient is the, the structure, the anatomy, the connections between the different uh, local dynamics. And the second ingredient is the local dynamics. Um, so we will take uh, exactly this, this, this standard whole brain models, but with some uh, nuances, with some uh, uh, adaptation that will be extremely useful for analyzing turbulence. The first one is, at the first level uh, of, uh, of one of the ingredients, namely the anatomy. And just concentrate on this panel B. These are uh, resuming uh, track tracing studies in monkeys from the lab of Henry Kennedy. And it's reflecting a very important anatomical rule discovered by uh, Marco van Kennedy and, and collaborators, which are called the exponential distance rules. So they, by doing these massive track tracing studies in monkeys, and of course they are, uh, they repeated that now in marmor sets. The, the nowadays we have also same results in mice from the Allen Institute, and all of them corroborated this type of uh, uh, rule, which is astonishing. Because what this is expressing is that the, the amount of connections, so the amount of fibers at the, any given point, in any given direction, so it's homogeneous and isotropic, is given just by the Euclidean distance. 
and express it by an exponential distance, uh, by an exponential function. Therefore, it's called the exponential distance rule. So, uh, in fact, we were verifying this in the context of the DTI, DMRI, tractography of our thousand subjects in the human connectome project. Of course, we know that the quality of the tractography DMRI is not fantastic. Uh, at least not comparable with the with the track tracing studies, but uh, in in any case we have done that, and in fact we managed to fit uh, pretty well an exponential distance world, and this is reflected here, for example, where here you have a pure exponential distance world, and this is uh, one uh, the average of the of the uh, structural connectome of the HCP subject. They look extremely similar, which is not a causality because we fitted the exponential rule to those uh, data. So, as I said, that is one of the ingredients. And instead of using now the standard tractography, we will use the exponential distance rules, just the exponential distance rule. So, the coupling in our case between two different regions in our Schaeffer parcellation will be given by a free parameter. This is actually the main. Uh, the main variable that we will study, this free parameter, which is just the coupling, so the, the effectivity of the connections, and the connection is given by the exponential distance rule where the exponent is fitted uh, from the data, from the tractography of the data. Then we will insert here our favorite local dynamics, and because we already have shown during the last five years that the Hof model, so an extension of the of uh, normal oscillators uh, is uh, is very good for that. We will take the Hof oscillator or Stuart Landa oscillators as the source of the local dynamics. And the second variant is that the way of looking at the functional label at the macroscopic label, instead of using just the, the standard functional connectivity or functional connectivity dynamics, we will uh, be focused on the structure function introduced by Kolmogorov, which in other words is nothing else as the functional connectivity, as I mentioned, and we have seen at the very uh, beginning, as a function of the Euclidean distance. Therefore, I am stressing this, uh, this fact here uh, on the cartoon. Okay, uh, this is one of the main results. As you see here, the, here we will check all the possible values of the global coupling parameters. Uh, this is the level of fitting of the data in the sense of the structure functions, in the sense of the functional connectivity as the function of the distance. And as you see, it's an error function, so it's a comparison between experiments and, and simulation. And there is a region where it's a minimum, so meaning that is the working region. So there is a region where we have a relative good fitting of the empirical uh, data. Good. That's not astonishing because, well, it's a little bit astonishing because uh, we know that the Hof model is a good uh, model of uh, brain dynamics, but uh, the Hof model with the, this reduced version of the anatomy, the exponential distance rule, we were not so sure about that, but in fact, it's working very well. So it's able to express the, 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 the emergence of functionality. Now, the interesting point is turbulence, and this is reflected here with the red curve. In fact, we are using exactly the same measure that we use it for analyzing the empirical data. I am showing here just the mean value of the empirical data, as you remember, very near to 0 0.2. Uh, but now we calculate the level of turbulence, namely the uh, variance of the local Kuramoto or the parameter of the model. Uh, for all possible points, for the working point and for all the other points. And what we see is that at the working point, so when we have here the minimum, we have a perfect fitting of the empirical level of turbulence. So the level of turbulence of the model is naturally, of course, uh, fitting the level of turbulence of the empirical uh, data, which is nice. But even more interesting, and this is the reason why we were doing the model, is the fact that at this particular point, it seems to be that the turbulence is maximal. And that is suggesting uh, the fact that perhaps turbulence is there in the context of neurodynamics for fulfilling some mission. And that mission is exactly like in the uh, fluid dynamic context, 
is for uh, implementing a, a, a very efficient transmission of uh, information uh, and energy across space and time. In fact, I mean, I will show you in a couple of slides that the, uh, we will have also like Kolmogorov a power law and that the goodness of fitting of this power law at that point will be already significant. In fact, it does continue also for for larger G, but the important thing is that at that point it's really we have a good uh, goodness of it. More importantly, I mean, we can define different measures which are now uh, trying to quantify in a much more direct way the the um, the information capabilities of the system. The most trivial measure. Uh, is the susceptibility. So you just perturb the system and see how, how reactive the system is. And that is uh, reflecting that. So as you see here, practically you reach the saturation already at the working point. So these are good news. More direct is really to perturb the system in many different ways and to see if the dynamic of the system is encoding that those perturbations, we use just a mutual information approach for that. And that is reflecting now in a very direct way how good the system uh, is able to encode information, external information, perturbations. And what we see is that this measure is has also a tendency to be maximal exactly at the point where the system is working, exactly at the point, and this is the important take home message, where the turbulence is maximal. Other measures like segregation, integration uh, are equilibrated exactly at that particular point. So just to, to, to finish this part, I mean, uh, this is exactly the movie that I was showing before, a particular subject of the HCP, and this is the model at the uh, optimal working regions, as you remember, where the minimum of the fitting of, uh, of the group label is. And as you can see here, I mean, uh, the label uh, of richness of the dynamics in sense of the, the variability of this local uh, measurement of uh, synchronization is very similar in both cases as was reflected by the measurement. So I, let me say just one word about the power law and then I try to convey the main message in the context of non-equilibrium for future works. So the power law, this is what we have seen at the very beginning in the context of uh, fluid dynamics. It was the origin of the of the Kolmogorov theory, the phenomenological theory of Kolmogorov of turbulence, and basically uh, capturing this intuition of uh, Da Vinci and Richardson, that the, this uh, hierarchical organization of the different sizes of the vortices of the label of local synchronization is, is not anecdotic, but it's important for the transmission of information and energy. And this is directly reflected in the fact uh, that uh, both measurements, structure function correlations and energy as a function of the space are showing in a given range, which is called the inertial subrange a power law, and this is reflecting efficiency, optimality. We wanted to see if we have the exactly the same in the context of frame dynamics, so we took uh, our HTTP data set and just concentrate on this. All the others are just double check. Well, this is structure function, this is uh, the Cousin of structure functions so or the, the functional connectivity, but just as a function of the distance, and, uh, and this particular nonsense, and as you see here, here you see the dispersion, but as you see here, there is a power law in a particular range. So there is also a kind of inertial sub range where we see a, a very efficient transmission of information. And of course, this can be reproduced with a model. Uh, in this case, it's not a logarithmic scale. Uh, these are the empirical data with all the, the, the fluctuation across subjects. And this is the model for many sensation of the model. And as you can see, we can uh, mechanistically also explain uh, very beautifully the uh, exponent and the emergence and the exponent of the uh, power law reflecting again this uh, this efficiency in the transmission of of uh, information across space and time. 
So just to close my talk, uh, I want to say the one, two words about non-equilibrium. Uh, the reason is turbulence has two main uh, features. One is what people or what we in physics call the, the mixing property. Uh, and it's what we were talking about during my talk. I mean, uh, the, the idea is that because of this, uh, this hierarchical organization of the, of the wheels, we can mix extremely efficiently uh, our, our main variable, velocity or whatever. In fact, I mean, I am, uh, I don't, I am a, a, a hobby cooker. And uh, the first thing that you learn when you cook is that if you want to, to mix many different ingredients, so you are cooking a soup, you have uh, the water and all the possible ingredients, the best thing that you can uh, do is in order to, to, to mix them is to generate turbulence. If you generate turbulence, you will mix them. This is the reason why also even nowadays uh, the turbulence is an active uh, area of research, not only in physics, in the quantum fluid dynamics, but also in the industry, because people for many reasons want to uh, mix uh, many different ingredients in a chemical plant or whatever. So first property of turbulence, mixing properties. And that is what we were analyzing all the time. But there is a second property and is that we have this mixing property, we can start this, uh, this cascadation through the hierarchical organization of the wheels, of the vortices, because the system is driven from outside. And of course, this is something elemental. I mean, it's not a big discovery. We know that we are constantly driven by the environment when we do a task, when we, even when we are at rest, we are, the brain is constantly driven. And this is what we call non-equilibrium. Uh, the, the only paradox is that at least uh, uh, from the theoretical point of view, we were always very scared about uh, non-equilibrium and for all the models and all uh, are assuming that the underlying system is in equilibrium, therefore we were really ignoring that all the time. In fact, non-equilibrium is a very important word, not only physics, as you know, uh, product of the pandemic. I mean, I was reading at the beginning of the pandemic this beautiful book of uh, Erwin Schrödinger, What is Life? And basically the take home message of the book is uh, that non-equilibrium is really one of the many ingredients of, uh, uh, of life. Uh, how we can assess uh, non-equilibrium? Uh, and I show in this uh, funny uh, way, what you see here on the left is a scene of this um, uh, movie from Christopher Nolan, uh, Tenet. Uh, I am showing that because what we the, actually it's not the best movie of Christopher Nolan. I, I am a fan of Christopher Nolan and that uh, was not so fantastic. But anyway, it's showing very well this fact that there are two types of uh, uh, persons. Uh, some of them are moving normal in time and some of them are moving backward in time. And it's very clear, even in that uh, particular sense, uh, who is who. Yeah. Uh, on the right, you see a system which is actually, uh, so, and, and this is a way of discovering that it's a non-equilibrium system when you have a non-reversibility, uh, means that it's non-equilibrium. This is a physical system. I don't tell you the details, it's a, it's a spin system. Uh, but I am now projecting here the movie forward and projecting here the movie backward. And as you can see, you cannot distinguish. If I, I if I'm not telling you that the blue is forward and red is backward, you cannot uh, separate them. And it's a physical system. But at that level, even if we know that it's, uh, it's showing non-reversibility, uh, it's in non-equilibrium because we, we designed it in that particular way, we cannot easily discover that. Again, I mean, some cases not that uh, the, the you cannot discover, but in some cases, really, you don't have reversibility, uh, non-reversibility. This is, again, a case like the movie that we have seen, a glass of wine shattered by a bullet, a shame per se, by the way, uh, forward, backward, very clear to know who is whom. This is the perfect uh, reversible system. The movie forward, the movie backward, 
and you cannot distinguish them. Why? Because there are no way of distinguish them. Forward and backward are identical. Why I'm saying this? Because if you remember the second law of thermodynamics, this was actually defining the arrow of time. So if you know that a system is reversible, so if you project the movie forward or you project the movie backward or the reversal actually, the, 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 what we call the, the reversal movie, and you cannot distinguish them, that means that the system is, uh, is perfectly reversible. If you can distinguish them, the system is non-reversible, and that implies that the system is a non-equilibrium that is driven from outside and is, can be captured in this way. There is a second way of capturing this, which is just uh, shown here, and I will not discuss that, the entropy production of the system, which is nothing else as, an, as a measure of the level of reversibility of those trajectories, uh, is also characterizing the non-equilibrium. So we have a simple way, a quantitative way, for the easy and for the difficult case to distinguish uh, how much the system is driven by the environment. And this is a very useful information in the context of neuroscience. And the way of assessing that is by or measuring the entropy production or measuring the uh, comparing the the movie forward and the movie backward and this is what we do and i finish with that we just take the signals in our case ball signals you can take this at the local network or global label and you have the normal signals and then you generate your backward movie and because it's so difficult to 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 know if that's uh, really who is whom you train a deep learning classifier uh, in order to distinguish the forward version from the artificially generated reversal version. But you know, because you generated that, so you can, in a supervised way, train this uh, deep learning classifier. And you know that if the pro performance of that is high, then the system is in non-equilibrium, it's non-reversible, the performance is low, it's reversible in equilibrium. So, Basically, the performance of this classifier on a training set, of course, on a cross-validation set, uh, is a quantitative measure of this level of non-equilibrium. And in fact, we do this with the classifier that we call TENET, this Temporal Evolution Deep Learning Network, and we do this at all levels, but I just showed, and it's my last slide, uh, uh, just concentrate on this uh, on the left part is the performance on the cross validation set of this uh, tenet network so of the level of non equilibrium for the hcp data but now we are analyzing not only rest but we are analyzing all the task conditions as you know we have seven different task conditions in the hcp and it's very interesting to see how they are ordered in terms of non-equilibrium. This is one take-home message. And the second take-home message, which I'm not showing here, is that, as you see here, under resting condition, subject has different level of turbulence. For each subject, we calculate, uh, sorry, different level of non-reversibility. For each subject, we also calculate the level of turbulence and the correlation between non-equilibrium, non-reversibility, and turbulence is uh, over 0 0.8. So meaning that they are going uh, two sides uh, of the same goal. So I think the take-home method is clear. These tools are uh, are useful, uh, I think, in the context of uh, neuroscience for revealing information about which are the fundamentals for an effective transmission of information across a space uh, and time. It's, 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 it's a trivial generalization. <laughs> a posteriori of the concept of synchronization. Instead of looking this globally, we look at this uh, locally and in a spatial-temporal way. And of course, this uh, motivated us also to look into the non-equilibrium and non-reversibility. So we also modified, again, the siphonaptera uh, in order to express the, the, the modeling part, uh, recursivity underlying those cascades between the, the wheels. This is my colleague and friend uh, Morton in pre-pandemic time. And of course, I am now ready for your questions and comments. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Gustavo. Everybody clap. <laughs>
get you some virtual feedback there. <laughs> <laughs> we are used, sadly, we are used to that now. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> um, so I guess a couple, uh, I've got a question I'll read to you in a minute, but, uh, or in a second here, but um, one question I had was, did you say you were a fan of Christopher Nolan or a friend of Christopher Nolan? No, 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 a fan, a fan, a fan. Ah, <laughs> a friend. A friend? I would love to be a friend of him. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 okay. No, I was just curious about that. Uh, <laughs> um, and... Uh, yeah, I, I um, let me read the first question to you. And as uh, if anyone has any questions, please enter them into the Q and A session or the chat window. Um, and we could read your question, or if you prefer, we can unmute you and have you ask uh, directly as well. So, uh, the first question is from Ardalan. It says, um, "Could you describe the relationship between Kolmogorov entropy and turbulence when you talked about rate of information exchange?" Was it easier to quantify the rate of information exchange simply by Kolmogorov entropy in the space-time space? No, I'm not using the Kolmogorov entropy. As you know, I mean, uh, the Kolmogorov entropy was used in the in in the context of chaos. It's related, of course, with turbulence. Eh? Uh, the Kolmogorov entropy, which uh, measured the 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 uncertainty in the predictability and, and therefore was defined in the context of the deterministic chaos, because if you have a deterministic system and a positive uh, Kolmogorov entropy, that was a demonstration of chaos. Turbulence, in fact, is a particular type of chaos. Uh, it's a spatio-temporal chaos. There is a huge discussion in the field if uh, if we are. If we can really uh, name uh, spatial temporal chaos and turbulence in the same way, but in in fact, I mean it's practically uh, the same. Uh, but in my case, I didn't use the Kolmogorov entropy. I mean, actually, it's a good idea uh, and would be another way of looking at the spatial temporal chaos, uh, perhaps in the context of human brain dynamics. Eh? Uh, it's another option. I decided really, I, th I think the tool that I used were much simpler, which was this uh, variability of the local uh, Kuramoto of the parameter. Uh, what I would expect is that, uh, of course, if I would use the Kolmogorov entropy in some way that I have to adapt to, to, to a multivariate system, which is not trivial, and I don't know really how to do that, but uh, Let's imagine that we can solve that problem. I would expect a huge correlation within level of turbulence and Kolmogorov of entropy. But this also has nothing to do with the other entropy that I mentioned at the end, with the production entropy, the entropy, yeah. Entropy okay, great, thank you. Um, one, one question I had was, um, so you, you, you're, you were kind of going back and forth between like in your video, um, you showed regional model estimates, but then you were, I guess, mostly focused on, I think, global, uh, global measures, right? Um, and so I was just curious, uh, how much you've looked at the regional variation in the parameters of the model and, and whether there's any interesting structure there, um, across brain regions. That, 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 that is an excellent question, Vince. Uh, in, 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 in what I have shown you today, uh, we have not done uh, that because uh, we basically, we have only one parameter, which is this coupling parameter. So the only breaking of the symmetry, the only source of heterogeneity is really the anatomy, which was also very simply given in, in terms of exponential distance rule. But of course, we formulated exactly the same question that <laughs> you formulated, and we were very, uh, very curious about that. There, there is a, a preprint in BioArchive uh, that uh, is going into the deep. So we were introducing different level of heterogeneities at the level of the local dynamics. And just to give you a flavor, it's a little bit technical, but the Hof oscillator is, is an oscillator that's changing amplitude. In fact, in some cases, I mean, could have amplitude zero. So it's a transition between no oscillation to oscillations. And then you can really adjust with the parameter how far you are in the non-oscillatory regime or in the oscillatory regime. And we were showing that uh, if you uh, let this parameter to be free and you adapt this to the empirical data, then there are some regions which are uh, very near to the bifurcation, so are 
subcritical. Uh, there are very regions which are noisy, and there are many regions which are supercritical, which are oscillatory. It, it, it turns out that's also the interpret, so the, meaning there are heterogeneity, there is a rich heterogeneity and differences. So if you are more picky, uh, and, and we were using turbulence for fitting the, the model. So if you are more picky, you get these differences. And those differences uh, were, uh, or are having a very nice interpretation, namely that the sensory regions are more noisy, the hubs, the, the, the rich clap is more at the bifurcations, uh, and some other regions are, are oscillatory. So, brief, quest, brief answer is uh, yes, heterogeneity is there and matters a lot and has a nice interpretation. <laughs> Um, a question from Armin, uh, can, can you capture different turbulence whirl sizes in the brain? Yes, uh, in fact, yes, and, uh, uh, and we were using that because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's also another preprint. Um, so you can imagine we were trying as a second step to use this in order to distinguish different brain states or different type of of diseases or whatever. Uh, and in fact, I mean, we were showing that the turbulence is a good uh, biomarker for that. So the level of turbulence in a wake is different than the level of turbulence in sleep. The level of turbulence in anesthesia is different from non-anesthesia the, 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 and in diseases exactly the, the same. But the better measure is if you uh, extend the concept of the local Kuramoto order parameter with the variable level of, of the size of the wheels. This is a free parameter for us. We use some parameter that was just optimized from the anatomy, but in reality, we are not obliged to do that. So, and it's an scaling, so the lambda of the exponential distance root is an scaling that we can, we can cover in a range systematically and it's basically characterizing or extracting different size of the wheels and that is very important because what we have seen is that the level of turbulence associated with the different size of the wheels is changing differently in different brain states so uh, short message i mean awake in sleep as i say the, the level of turbulence is less in sleep and when you go to uh, anesthesia or coma it's also less in unconsciousness but of course sleep is not similar to coma even if they have the same level of turbulence but when you look in a, in a more precise way by taking into account the size of the wheels then you see different profile and therefore it's very interesting so it's possible yes and the the the, the answer is you can do that just by changing the lambda and you have done the freedom to do that and look at the difference the level of turbulence associated with the different size of the wheels. Hopefully I answered it. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, other questions? Let me see if we... Um, so, um, one question I had was, as you know, we do a lot of work in sort of, you know, brain decompositions, you know, things like that. So can, uh, can you envision, um, thinking about like blind source separation model, um, where we have, I don't know if this analogy will work, but we have, so we're basically modeling as a mixing, right? A mixing matrix, you know, um, uh, of brain regions over time or brain, you know, networks over time. Um, and it might be interesting to explore more complex um, mixing models, right? And, and I'm wondering if there might be some way to, to bring in this turbulence, the turbulence model or concept into uh, a mixing model um, at the source level. Um, maybe that's something we can talk about online it's it's um or offline rather it's um yeah it's, it's so 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 you, you if, if you look at it over time right and you decompose it you know so as, as you know turbulence increases decreases you might imagine the the yeah, yeah, distributions yeah. might also be um 
it's just it's, related uh, in different ways, right? It's an interesting uh, idea. I have to think about that. Yeah, yeah. My intuition is that, of course, it's possible because we can define the level of turbulence at the network levels. Mm -hmm. That at least we can see how the different networks, uh, in terms of turbulence, uh, are mixed. So I can imagine that we can characterize this mix it from this mixing from the point of view of the turbulence. So it, sh it should be possible. I mean, I, right, right, right. And I, I think even more maybe, not only how the mixing varies for networks that you've estimated, but re-estimating the networks as a function of time, right? Oh, that, that's right. what I'm thinking is the more interesting question. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I both I think are interesting, but um, the, the other one is uh, a, a little bit more variable and gets into spatial dynamics as well that that Armin is is very interested in also. So I agree, I agree. as a way of of defining the network basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, if anyone wants to work on that, reach out to Gustavo, myself, Armin, whatever. So <laughs> <laughs> um, we're we're up for team science on anything. So happy to help. Um, <laughs> I'll speak for you, uh, Gustavo. So. <laughs> um, okay, well, thank you very much. Um, Armin, did you want to comment on uh, what happens next? I guess we've got this uh, recorded um, and what will happen with that and, and how will people access it, et cetera? Sure, I will send a, a recorded video soon, like in a day. And if you have, there are a couple of questions that I can share on the Slack channel. So we can follow up and answer more question on the Slack. So there's a dedicated channel for this talk that we can have a conversation over there, over time, not just today. Great, great. And great. so um, there's a way to continue the conversation uh, and, and, and interact. Um, I guess before we before we let you go, uh, I'll, I'll get I'll answer this. I'll ask this one more question, which I had missed earlier from Andy K, which says. Um, does this, and I'm not sure exactly what this is referring to, but maybe does the, the work that you're talking about relate to the traveling waves observed in the brain? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, um, we don't know, of course, I mean, because we have not seen that, and, uh, and uh, I can only speculate about that. Uh, I, I think so, of course, I mean, because at the end of the day, the traveling waves uh, are reflecting a uh, different level of synchronization. Of course, I mean, uh, generally you, you are observing those traveling waves with the G and it's at the surface level and so on. So are they only externally reflected, but uh, I, I think they are exactly reflecting this, this, uh, this, uh, this different level of local or this, the changing of the local synchronization. I mean. Not so easy to relate as uh, um, directly, I have to confess, because uh, as as you saw, the way of uh, being able to talk about turbulence is because we have a relatively good uh, fine resolution at the space level, mm. which is not the case of EEG. So that is not so easy to talk about turbulence in the context of EEG. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, there was a there was another question about EEG, which is, can you use turbulence to separate rhythmic from non-rhythmic, so oscillate oscillatory from chaotic activity? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, and 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 in fact, I mean that 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 just let me. We we are very interested on that. I mean, because um, paradoxically, in the context of especially of consciousness, I mean, people are relating uh, um, rhythmic activity with unconsciousness and not rhythmic activity with uh, with wakefulness and it's an exaggeration it's like a binarization of a very complex uh, uh, process as i mentioned before we measure turbulence and we have turbulence in both states even in coma we have turbulence uh, we, we were analyzing data from Perry, from Lionel Nakash, and from uh, Stephen Lory in Liege. I mean, and they have a very clear, uh, I mean, it's significantly different from a wake, but it's turbulent, it's genuinely turbulent. So, what that means is that uh, I think turbulence is a much finer way of characterizing rhythmic against non rhythmic. And I think rhythmic uh, against uh, non rhythmic is, is like a binarization of of that complex uh, uh, process. And therefore, uh, of course, I would use turbulence in that context. 
The problem is, as I said, with the EEG is a little bit difficult. It's not impossible. We are working on that, though, extending uh, the concept of Kuramoto. So there's, there's not a preprint already, huh? No, <laughs> not <laughs> that, yet. <laughs> for that, not. <laughs> we don't have to do it. All right. Well, um, thank you so much for your time, and uh, thanks to everyone else for for joining us. Um, uh, it was a really interesting session, and 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 I just love hearing about your work. So. Uh, we do appreciate that and hope you have a, a great holiday season and um, looking forward to seeing you in person at some point in the future. Actually, <laughs> we, we deserve that. <laughs> Thank you yes. so much, uh, Vince and the audience. I mean, it was really a pleasure and also Merry Christmas to everybody and good holidays. <laughs> Thanks, Gustavo. Okay. Take care, everyone. <laughs>